good afternoon, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, and my lucky fellow residents in the new Malaysia. For those of you who are not familiar with the Jeffrey Chia Institute Forum, let me uh, say a few words about JCI. Sir, you have a question? Oh, J the Jeffrey Chia Institute is the public education component of the Sunway Education Group. And it is a think tank that was set up to, to analyze public policy issues that are of current interest. And we have had a big change in Malaysia of which the youth played a fundamental part. And I thought it is important for us to understand what are the forces that have brought about the changes, and hence we can think about what the future might hold for the country. So we are very lucky today to have Wasiha Hassan, Syed Siddiq, uh, Lim Yi Wei, uh, who, who will talk on the topic of the changed political landscape and the aspirations of the youth. I have invited as moderator Liu Jin Tong, the person who had publicized, who had predicted boldly uh, since two years ago about a possible change in the big uh, political circumstances, not only of the world, but in Malaysia. So let me invite Liu Jin Tong to come up the stage. And let me invite the other speakers as well. Uh, thank you, Wing. Um, to all of you who are here, a uh, very good afternoon. To the, um, I think I'm not very sure why I'm here because um, I usually don't, don't moderate, but I think because Wing thought that I have no job, so... Um, <laughs> So he gave me something to do. <laughs> but we are here to discuss uh, a ch the changed landscape of Malaysia. We are still in this uh, whole new period that we are trying to figure out how we move forward as a nation. There will be old challenges, old fault lines, but there will be new potential. And of course, the youth is a very important factor. And today, we are very honoured to have uh, one of the youngest ministers uh, in the world. I'm told not the youngest. And I, I told Sadiq uh, just, just before he was uh, formally appointed, I say he has to prepare for a very long political career, where at some point he will, he will be leader of opposition, and at some point he will be prime minister. <laughs> the part on opposition leader is important. Why? Because on 9 of May, there was no bloodshed. And because there was no bloodshed, we will have to be prepared that at some point we'll lose. There will be, there will be change of government and there will be rotations of power in the future. And that, that is part of the new landscape. And we also have uh, Dr. Wishal uh, Hassan, uh, as well as uh, Lim Yi Wei. I think I don't want to go into too much of uh, introducing uh, our speakers, but uh, just, to, just to say a few words of, about our speakers. Uh, Dr. Wishal Hassan is the director of uh, INSET, and he will give us uh, a presentation with slides. And also, uh, I don't think Yi Wei has a slide. Uh, I think politicians don't need slides to talk. <laughs> Uh, UA is uh, one of our youngest uh, elected reps. Not the youngest, huh? This term also not the youngest. Right? Who, who is the youngest? Uh? Uh, no, I mean our party from DAP. Oh, Chi, yeah, okay. We have a, a 26-year-old, uh, uh, what they call the uh, ex-co from the DAP. But uh, Yiwei is among one of the youngest in DAP. And I think with her, with Sadiq, 
uh, with many others who are who are involved. I hope that we will have will have a different future, and hopefully, we can actually chart a different discourse for New Malaysia. So, with that, I would like to uh, invite uh, Doctor to give your presentation. She's just now sitting between the two young politicians. Of course, it, it, it is a symbol of what we are facing in Malaysia today. The experienced old politicians combined with the, some of the youngest politicians. And so it's, it, great, it brings great hope to Malaysia's future, actually. Now, the beginning of the changed political landscape, I will talk about, actually, the title is looking at the changed political landscape through clinical lens. What do we understand by clinical lens is looking below the surface. What are the issues that were contributing to the changed political landscape? While media and uh, analysts, everybody else was looking at the 10% of what was visible, most of you will have known the iceberg metaphor, you know. Everybody was looking at the 10% that was visible. I was looking at the 90% that was invisible to research what is going to happen to the landscape, changed landscape. And thankfully, uh, what I was thinking did happen. And I did write to the Prime Minister to say that while the entire uh, media and foreign analysts were thinking of Baisan being brought back to the government, I was quite sure that Pakatan would win because I had applied what I call large group psychology to come to my conclusion. And let's look at some of the issues. The beginning of the changed landscape started in 2008, as you all know. There has been a shift in the political landscape in Malaysia. Why? Right? In 2008, we lost for the first time. The ruling party lost the two-third majority. And the 2013 further eroded the popular vote in favor of the opposition. And 2018 saw the change in government. In my PhD research on Malay leadership, which was completed around 2013, I had said this, I quote, the manner in which Abdullah Barawi was made to step down may unfortunately set a precedent which is untypical in the Malay culture. This leads to the question of how successful the political Malay leadership in the country will be in future. No doubt, for the first 50 years since Merdeka, the Malays have gen overall provided a stable and admirable leadership in political management of the country. How this will be in the next 50 years is wrought with some uncertainty based on the poor performance in the 2008 general election of the amno led coalition. As this chapter was being edited, the 2013 general elections had just concluded, and the AMNO led coalition winning even fewer seats than the previous elections in 2008. We may have to wait for a while to see how this, the political leadership of Malays would emerge from this new trend, which has provided a new challenge to Malay leadership in the country. Badawi also gave the impression that he wanted more openness and that he was prepared to face a stronger opposition, which ultimately could lead us to a two-party system. This was in 2012, 2013. I, I did that, uh, I think 2013. And uh, today we do have that as a reality. Now we do have a two-party system. Huh? For the first time in 60 years, the government has been changed by the will of the people. Of course, it's not easy. I would also like to quote why it was not easy. And this is a quote again from my research. The fear of losing political power 
in their homeland will make the Malays disinclined to reject their current elected leader, meaning the previous Prime Minister, for fear of further weakening Malay leadership. Even when the excesses committed by their leaders are extremely displeasing to followers, it is painful and difficult for the Malays to go against the deep instinct to respect their leader because this is deeply ingrained in the Malay psyche. And then I said, when Malays collectively feel that they need a change, they tend to adopt the Sankanchil approach. I will explain to you what I mean by Sankanchil approach. Uh, using cunning and wit rather than direct confrontation. That was my conclusion. And understanding the Malay leadership is very important for us because Malay leadership has provided the base for governing this country together with the coalition partners. But because all the prime ministers have been Malays in the past, they were the people who led directly to the success and the pragmatic policies of Malaysia. And therefore, the best books to read will be the Malay Dilemma, which still is applicable to many of the issues that face the Malays. And then there are other books. But my book is in the middle. And that is the only book which, to date, has stood the academic rigor of going through a PhD research. So it has been approved by academics. I had to face five people in a public debate when I graduated. So that is an academically proven uh, book. So there are a lot of other books, of course. The Malay loyalty to Amno. See, since 1940s, Malay leadership and Amno are seen as synonymous in the eyes of the Malays. Because the Amno negotiated Merdeka, and then the Amno also protect the, protected the Malay rulers from uh, Malay, Malayan Union in the 1945. And therefore, over the 70 years, Amno leadership and Malays have enjoyed very cozy relations. The reasons for the loyalty of the Malays are also because of the many cultural attributes, respect for, deal, uh, for leaders based on the concept of kedaulatan. And uh, the opposite is derhaka. You know, people, the, the kedaulatan is a very basic concept in Malays because they respect for the rulers. In the original good old days, the rulers meant the rulers, the sultans and the rajas, but it has watered down to political leaders to this day. And then the high power distance index, where the respect for authority is accepted by the people at the lower level. And then conflict avoidance. Malaysians, by nature, are conflict avoidant. And then the Sabar and Kasihan factors that also affect the Malays. Eh? And the dependency syndrome, of course, uh, the Malays were very much dependent on the government. And also the ascription oriented, which means people who are related become, get into positions. The three out of the seven prime ministers, or let's look at the six prime ministers, because the seventh is the same person. <laughs> out, of the, out of the six prime ministers, you will know that three of the prime ministers were related to one another, either by marriage or through uh, uh, birth. And then you can see how the ascription is powerful in the Malay psychology, because you have are related. So we automatically assume, oh, if the father, the father is a good leader, the son will automatically be a good leader. And that is a myth, <laughs> as we will see later. <laughs> then the Sankanchil syndrome. When the Malays felt very uncomfortable, they never approach or oppose the leaders directly. What they do, they use the tricks of Sankanchil, which wins over its enemies, the crocodiles, the tigers, and the pythons, using its wit. And that's exactly what happened during the last elections. We knew how the Chinese were feeling, because the Chinese expressed their emotions very openly. The Indians even more, <laughs> right? There was no problem of guessing who the Chinese and the Indians in Malaysia were going to support. But the big question mark of where the Malays stood. And nobody knew how the Malays would vote. And 
And even to this day, they were split quite evenly. Maybe uh, I think PAS had some percentage, AMNO, and then Pakatan. And combined, uh, Pakatan managed to uh, get the majority in the parliament. So this is what, uh, as the Malays do not oppose or disagree openly with rulers or superiors, they could only resort to indirect means to outwit them. That's exactly what happened. And Dr. Mahade has observed the Malays. Huh? The courtesy and self-effacing habits of Malays are but one aspect of the Malay character. And he says do, they are never frank and they are never open with their, uh, with their uh, observations or their emotions. And therefore, it is fallacious to accept Malays at face value. That's why it's very, very difficult to psychologically analyze the Malays because they are not very effective people. They are emotionally neutral, very neutral. You cannot guess what they are thinking. <laughs> and also, the Malays are a very compliant society. They, people, and because of their compliance, people have taken advantage of them over the years, the 600 over years since Malacca Sultanate. Initially by the rulers, then the colonialists, and then the political leaders, now corporate leaders. Everybody takes full advantage of their self-effacing uh, attribute. Originally, Malay leaders were all elitists. As you know, Tunku Abdul Rahman, Tun Abdul Razak, Hussein On, they come from, from the elite uh, society of the Malays. Because the Malay, the common Malay, was very much uneducated and was in a regressive mode. If you read my research, you will understand that. Therefore, the elitists had to stand in as leaders. The first common Malay to become the Prime Minister was Dr. Mahathir. After Dr. Mahathir, then elitism slowly backed into the leadership. Of course, uh, Tun Abdullah Badawi, I may not consider him as a 100% elitist, but he's of Arab descendant. And you know how the Malays respect the Arabs. They are treated like semi-gods also, you know, Arab. <laughs> Any Arab. <laughs> and of course, uh, uh, Former Prime Minister Najib was also the son of Tun Abdul Razak, who was an elitist. So the elitism came back to Malay leadership after Dr. Mahathir retired. The only big fundamental difference between elitism before and after Dr. Mahathir was the elitist leaders before Dr. Mahathir, people like Tunku Abdul Rahman and Tun Abdul Razak, were coming down to the ground level to understand the common man and the problems. You know that Tunku Abdul Rahman was very mixing with all levels of people. Similarly, Tun Abdul Razak, if you look at some of the younger generation who may not know, look at some of the old pictures of Tun Abdul Razak. He visits the villages, the downtrodden areas, to make sure there is development in the rural areas. So they were people with complete contact with the uh, people at the ground level, grass level. After him, the elite alienated themselves from the people. Even cabinet members who were from common, uh, from common Malays behaved like pseudo-elitists. And they were completely cut off from reality. And that's why they saw the consequence at the last election. The boiled frog syndrome. I, uh, you see, let us assume, I, to give you an example, let's assume Professor Wu Wingtai is a frog. Uh, I take him and put him in a boiling pot of water. What would be his reaction? Immediately he will jump out, right? But if I take the frog again and put him in a pot of cold water, he will be enjoying himself in the cold water. What I will do? I will put fire under the pot and slowly begin to heat the water. And as the water begins to boil, the frog does not feel the heat getting in until it gets boiled to death. And this is exactly what happened with Barisan National when uh, they were, for 60 years, they were ruling the, peop the, the country and they did not see the heat that was beginning to generate from underneath and they were boiled to death. So that's what we call the, uh, the boiled frog syndrome. And the other factor that played a critical role in uh, the formation of the new government was what I will call the collective power, 
uh, the power of the collective unconscious. You see, the people, when they are collectively unconscious and they all have the same feeling, then it leads to hardship to people, and then it leads to, because of scandals. A lot of scandals or calamities happen and leads to hardship, large group regression, and then there is a collective unconscious. And then people start to have a feeling of shame. When Malaysians go abroad, all the scandals are, tell, are told to them. You know, oh, you come from Malaysia. Did you hear of this scandal, that scandal? So feeling of shame, humiliation, helplessness. The, 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 the citizens felt almost helpless because of that uh, large group regression and the collective unconscious. And a lot of anxieties uh, to, to uh, a lot of anxieties came into the picture. So the collective unconscious can lead to all the people thinking alike, anger, and therefore it led to the fall of the government because of the collective unconscious. And I can give you two examples of the collective unconscious. In 2014, Brazil was hosting the World Cup. And many of you may know that Brazil at that time was a very powerful team. But the people in Brazil were completely against the full World Cup being held in Brazil because they thought that it was a waste of money and the, uh, the Brazil could not afford to have the football World Cup there. And therefore, the collective unconscious of the people was not with the Brazilian team, and they lost to Germany at the semi-final or somewhere there. Of course, you may ask why then they lost in 2018. That's a different story. <laughs> I'm, only, I'm only relating to the experience in 2014. Okay? And then uh, the victory of Springbok. Some of you may have known that in 1995, for the first time, uh, World Cup, uh, Rugby World Cup was being held in South Africa. And Springboks, which was a very weak team in South Africa, which was not expected to win because of the support given by Nelson Mandela. And he rallied the blacks who considered Springboks as their enemy to support them. That collective unconscious made the victory for uh, Springboks in 1995. These are some of the examples to show you the collective unconscious, how powerful it can be in a glory or in a trauma. Now, what are the lessons to be learned? With, yes, I'm finishing with these two slides. What are the lessons to be learned from this experience? Leaders must understand the importance of knowing themselves. Do not underestimate knowing yourself. Nurture the community. Office shows the person. When you are in the power, then will you see the real person. You may be the, before that, you may be willing to serve the citizens. But when you are in the seat, how do you behave? That's exactly what will show you the nature of the person. And then you must be in contact with the community. Always embrace truth. Live by a higher code. Never underestimate the personal integrity. And then character is destiny. And I finally will say that do not build your strategy on lies. Never underestimate the... Uh, importance of leadership succession. You see, one of the weaknesses of our country in the past has been that we assume that the son or, or the descendant of a good leader will automatically be a good leader. So we should not be neglecting the importance of leadership succession. Pay attention to governance issues, check and balances, government institutions, listen to the people, family dynasty and leadership, which may bring naivety of assuming children of successful leaders will be like their parents. So those were some of the things. And finally, I conclude with this quotation. Organizations are like automobiles. They don't run themselves except downhill. <laughs> <laughs> they need people to make them work. And not just any people, but the right people. With that, I thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Wasihan. I think it is, it is not necessarily uh, good for political analysis to think of political behavior purely on racial groups. Because actually, if you look at the trends in, in 2008, 
before 2008, no one expected any Chinese would support the opposition in such a big way. And I remember in 2007, when we were campaigning in the Egypt by election, April 2007, 90% of Indians voted for Barisan National. A year later, there was a sea change. So this election, the swing among Malay voters may not necessarily, uh, it's not actually new. It's not actually new because it happened in 1999. Uh, and it's just, a different sort of dynamic. The other point I just want to make briefly is that this election, I think is, you want to define this election, is probably this is an anti-Najib election. The, the, the votes for pass in Kelantan and Trunganu is not necessary for pass. Just as, to be humble, the votes for Pakatan on the West Coast is not necessary for Pakatan, but anti-Najib. I think that's where we have to start our work. Uh, we have to build a narrative for, in order for people to support Pakatan in the next election. But this election, in order to interpret the election result, it is the best analysis, I think, is to see it as an anti-Najib election, just that the agent of anti-Najib would be passed in Kelantan and Trunganu, whereas in the West Coast, it was Pakatan. Anyway, I shouldn't be speaking uh, because... Um, <laughs> The minister has to leave at uh, 3.45, so I hope maybe uh, Sadiq can speak for 15 minutes and uh, Iwe can speak for 15 minutes. Then we open up uh, more, uh, more time for discussions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sir Lu Chin Tong. Um, I still call him Sir <laughs> up to today. I remember when I first got into politics, one of the first persons who I looked up to is uh, Liu Chin Tong. Uh, I still see him as a mentor in politics. I really love his multiracial viewpoint, and I think uh, one thing which he has is foresight. I think he's able to predict the right things happening at uh, the right time, while others were very skeptical at the beginning. So I want to start, first I, I'll try my best not to take 15 minutes, preferably I just want to take 10. Let's spend more time uh, at QA because I see a lot of you are enth enthusiastic people. I'm pretty sure you have amazing questions to ask <laughs> uh, and killer questions as well. Um, but this is my opinion on G14. One is while we consider the swing in Malay votes, we must also consider a strong swing in youth voters. And the in G13, there were about 35 to 36% of voters who were below 40 years old. And in GE14, the number increased to 41%. And I'm talking about youth voters who registered and who went out to vote. In contrast to um, even other countries, while there were those who were very skeptical, saying that young people are very apathetic, they do not care, they will not partake in the political process. But if you are to compare ourselves with other countries, actually youth voter turnout in our country is one of the highest. Despite the fact that 2.5 million uh, people have yet to register to vote, but yet in terms of voter turnout among young people, and also when we are to look at the result of the election or where the youth swung to, I think it played a very significant role. So now we are still in the process of compiling all the data, but I'm looking at a few marginal seats. For so example, in Moa, JB, a seat which was really difficult at the beginning, especially with a giant like Tan Sri Shari Samad, and a few other marginal seats um, in areas like Melaka and also in Wilaya, like Titiwangsa and uh, Setiwangsa. If you look in these areas, actually there was, not, there was not a big swing in the Saluran 1, 2, 3. If you know Saluran 1, 2, 3 are those who are generally um, older. Um, 4, 5, 6 are the youth channels. And we go even in areas like Pago, where Tan Sri Muhyiddin Yassin, one of the big wigs of Pakatan Harapan contested in, he lost in a lot of the Saluran Patlimanam. But in almost all the youth Saluran, he won, and with such a huge majority. In JB, I think, except for three, all the youth Saluran went to Pakatan Harapan. In Mua, last I checked, except for two, all went to Pakatan Harapan, even in uh, my predecessor's very own village or hometown. So in Moa and then the Sungai Balang, in Sungai Balang, there's 
uh, Seri Menanti, which is a place where he was brought up, not a big uh, PDM, but even then the youth vote swung the other way. We showed that youth voters were so keen for change. While I start about youth voters and being slightly more optimistic of them swinging to Pakatan, I agree with, uh, uh, with Liu Chintong's analysis. Because if you go to Kelantan, you go to Terengganu, you go to pockets of Kedah, it was the exact opposite. Those who are above 40, 50 are still voting for BN, but young ones predominantly voted for PAS. PAS won big in Kelantan and Terengganu. If you look at the youth salurans, they won, I mean, hands down, in some areas or in a lot of areas in Kelantan and Terengganu, we lost our deposit. That means we not just lost, we were trashed. <laughs> and the youth who came from Kelang Valley went back, spent their money, not to vote for Harapan, but to vote for PAS. And it was an overwhelming majority in Kelantan and Terengganu. Harapan did not even win one seat. Even in seats where Dato' Husam Musa, big, a big wig, well-known, well-respected, to be seen as the mentee of Tok Guru. He lost, and he lost big. In Kedah, the swung happened. Again, you look in areas like Pendang, we lost big because of you voters. But over there, I think we were slightly lucky. Pass is traditionally very strong in these areas, Pahang, Kelantan, Terengganu, and Kedah. But I think because Tun M and Datuk Sri Mukris Mahadi, we were still able to withstand the tsunami there. Because by then, I think at least voters there were still unsure, while people were very anti-Najib. But who would be able to form the government? Some thought it would be PAS, some thought it would be Pakatan Harapan. In Kelantan, in Kelantan, Trungalanu, fairly clear. It will be PAS. In other parts of Malaysia, it's fairly clear that it will be Harapan. So I just want to point out that, firstly, the youth votes played a very important role in shaping the outcome of the election. The second part to look here is, where will the youth head to in the future? And this is to assess the future political scene of Malaysia. While I always start off with an optimistic tone, I think we need to inject some sense of realism. And my biggest fear is that the pendulum will swing the other way if things move too fast and rapidly. What do I mean? In one of the most open democracies like America, you know where institutions of democracy are fairly solid, where democratic, uh, where, where, where democratic norms and practices are enshrined and are ingrained in the mindsets of fellow Americans, even then we saw a surge in right-wing politics in such a short time span after we had a fairly open and liberal president like Barack Obama. It swung very quickly. And while some might argue that it's not just about a right-wing brand of politics, it was also attributed to economic woes and issues, but economic woes and issues were largely linked by Donald Trump to racial issues. If you notice, when they talk about the loss in jobs, they say this is the fault of the Mexicans. This is the fault of the Latin Americans. This is the fault of, the, uh, this is the fault of Asians, especially China. So it's still linked back to... Um, dogmatic uh, issues. So let's look back in Malaysia. I think the most recent analysis we received is that Malay voters were split almost equally three ways. PAS, Pakatan, and also uh, AMNO or Barista National. But then you have to break it down state by state. Because in actuality, for example, in southern Malaysia, we got up some 35, some even as high to 45%. In Moa, I think it went up almost to 50%. So obviously, I want to promote Moa a little bit here. <laughs> Um, so, but if you look in areas like Kelantan, Terengganu, some even was as low as 3% or 5%. Um, so we cannot be too confident into thinking that everyone is ready and we can just bulldoze, bulldoze changes very quickly. Because the fear is that the pendulum will swing the other way. So what is the way forward then? One is, I think, is to lock in institutional reforms as quickly as possible so that we develop democratic norms and practices in which then will change mindsets of people which will ensure that no matter who forms the government, the reforms will continue, which requires large reforms in education, strong reforms in democratic practices in terms of reforming the media, institutions of democracy, 
so that from there onward, even if there's a change in government, even if a right-wing government comes in, then by then we will be prepared regardless. But this must be done as quickly as possible. The second part here is to also threat very lightly to not fall into the trap of AMNO and PATH. I've predict that in GE15, PATH and AMNO will merge. And this time will merge very seriously. If you look at your brand of politics today, especially after the outcome of the AMNO election, I think if YBKJ won, I'm very sure that the merge will not happen. But when Zaid Hamidi won, you look at the three night presidents, Ismail Sabri, Khaled Nordin, and Mahathir Khalid. Except for Khaled Nordin, the two are clear-cut right-wing in terms of their stance and ideology, very close to past. Even if you look at Pemuda and Wanita, won, won by Dr. Ashraf Waiji, not by Azwan Bro, again, fairly pivoting to past. And I think that change and shift will happen, I think, especially if they know that they can merge the Malay votes and they think they will be able to capture some Nanjung and from there onward negotiate with Sabah and Sarawakian parties to form the federal government in the future. And if they're able to do so, that's almost a solid 60% Malay votes. But that's just me giving a more darker picture. It's still the optimistic side. Previously, Amno played patronage politics like mad with, uh, with the perception of blind obedience among civil servants. So there's almost a confirmed Amno voter base not because they support AMNO, but because AMNO is in government and due to their patronage link. So now that's gone. Um, but it's just to point out that that might be the future. And we can see that even a statement given out by PASS recently that they will not participate in the by-election which will take place in Selangor soon, unless it is a two-way fight. And I'm very confident that behind closed doors there are negotiations with AMNO at the moment to ensure that it is a two-way fight and from there they'll be able to assess what is the future of Malaysian politics. If it's a two-way fight, straight fight between PAS or Pakistan or AMNO with Pakistan, what is the outcome there? So while that is, or there's a distinct possibility that will be the new front, what should Harapan do? On the one hand, Harapan should draw a very clear line that while the federal constitution will still be respected and upheld, which is the uniting factor of Pakatan and Harapan, despite having parties like Bersatu, DAP, PK and Amana, which have their own values and virtues. While we have that, we must also ensure that we draw ourselves as the more centrist, multiracial coalition than what is being presented by PAS and AMNO. At the same time, we can't fall into the trap of going too much to the left where we isolate not the hardcore Harapan voters. Let's not, let's not forget that the vast majority of those who voted for us are not Harapan members. Our party membership is nowhere as close to PAS and AMNO. PAS is have a million membership. AMNO has three million. I'm pretty sure none of Pakatan Harapan component parties even come close to a million. But a lot come from the average Malaysian who wants to see change, who's not a loyal or ideologically blind party member, but who's hungry for change. So we must not isolate that voter base by going too fast to the left, while forgetting that Malaysian politics haven't truly evolved in moving forward. But the unique part is I believe Harapan will be able to persevere through this. A lot predicted that we will break up. We didn't. I know we're more solid than ever. We're very much united. While there are some policy disagreements, but it's very minute, and I believe we will be able to move forward together. I'm still optimistic. I will believe that we will be able to persevere through this election, so the next election. But I think the next two to three elections, I think there might be a change in government once more. But again, I'd like to end my statement with this. The election victory, while it's something which is surprising and which relieved millions of Malaysians, should not be taken lightly because Malay voters were split into three segments. At the same time, there was a strong anti-Najib sentiment, which AMNO did not foresee. And in the upcoming election, you are looking at the possibility of a merger between AMNO and PAS, a possible, uh, I mean, I'll call it a very big miss in asset 
which might be to Dr. Mahathir Mohamad, which were able to unite Pakatan Harapan in ways which no one could ever foresee and fill in the Malay leadership vacuum. You know, when people say Tun Mahathir is the uh, um, Malay right-wing supremacist, at the same time, then Amno tried to go, Mahathir is uh, being used by Lim Kit Siang. It's very hard for Malays to believe that <laughs> uh, because he has been labelled that way for decades. But when there is an absence in that, then what is the way forward? So GE15 will be truly interesting. But I believe will truly signify the future of multiracial Malaysia. I believe in the end, if fellow Malaysians, like in GE14, played a role in going out door to door, house to house, restaurant to restaurant, peer to peer among friends and family members, campaigning despite not wearing a party, party uniform or holding a party flag, they were able to win the election, not party members, but the average Malaysian, the rakyat who campaigned without any financial rewards, do the same because they want that visionary, multiracial, moderate Malaysia. I believe then true reforms will be able to be locked in, that even if there's a change in government, Malaysians should not worry because the system alone has been corrected. Thank you. Thank you, Sadek, uh, for this uh, rather less than optimistic uh, view. So in order to provide a balance to that, I cannot resist uh, the temptation of being the fourth speaker. <laughs> Just to say that uh, Sadek has very important responsibility to secure Pakatan's government. One is to, uh, to lower the voting age to 18 years old. That will increase 3 million uh, voters into the system. The other one, I think, uh, is, is about ensuring young people have better jobs, better pay, and better opportunities. See, the, what was pointed out by Sadiq was interesting. The backlash against Obama essentially was a mix of identity politics, but because of the backlash from white, poorer white uh, community. We have a collective res responsibility here to ensure that in five years' time, less Malaysians are working in Singapore. We have a collective responsibility to ensure that young people get better pay, better job, better future, better opportunities. And I think that is where I need to I would like to just add a bit of nuances to what Sadiq said. In terms of economic policy, I think we should move a bit left. Left in the sense of ensuring that there is, there is this equation of distribution and growth. Not only that we are talking about growth, we are also talking about distribution. And in order to, have, to use distribution, equitable distribution to actually increase growth for the future and for the long run. But in terms of identity politics, we must be the centrist entity. And I think one way will be to, to bring back the discussions of Bangsa Malaysia. To bring back the discussion of Bangsa Malaysia so that we create a centrist identity for all and for everyone to feel comfortable to embrace it. And I think that uh, a lot also has to do with uh, youth minister. A lot has to do with how we reconfigure this identity that actually at one point captured the imagination. In the early 90s, when Sadiq was born. <laughs> so here, here I'm the not, not too old man, but uh, a bit older. See, in the early 90s, when Mahathir talked about Vision 2020, when Mahathir talked about Bangsa Malaysia, there was a period of time where majority of Malays, majority of Chinese, majority of Indians, majority of Malaysians feel that they have a stake in this enterprise. And I think this is where the challenge for this government is to create that sense of common identity, that sense of common destiny. And this is where we have to work on. I invite uh, Iwe to continue.
Thank you, Sadar Liu Chin Tong. Um, also, thank you to uh, Dr. Basiha and Said Sadiq. Um, I think the previous speakers have stolen uh, some of the points I was planning to present, so I'm rather um, panicky in uh, restructuring my points now. Uh, but I found that um, I'll just give you a quick background myself uh, because I think some of you might not know me and this is my first term as an assembly woman. So my name is Lim Yi Wei. I grew up in Ipoh, uh, re very regular family, among family of teachers. So my parents were teachers, my aunt was a teacher, my grandmother was a teacher and look where I turned out. I managed to get a scholarship to do my degree in finance in Hong Kong. And like a lot of uh, young, especially non-Malays, I decided that my future was uh, better off overseas. So right after graduating, I decided to work uh, in one of the financial sectors doing conferences. And in 2014, the umbrella revolution happened. Does anyone here uh, not know what the Umbrella Revolution is? You can put up your hand. Yeah, so the Umbrella Revolution was a student movement in Hong Kong, um, which fought for the right of Hong Kongers to vote for their leaders, for their government. And watching the Umbrella Revolution, although I really had no skin in the game other than wanting my rent to go down, <laughs> made me ask difficult questions of myself. The first thing was, what was I doing here? What was I doing in Hong Kong when our country could do with more youths returning to contribute? The second question I asked myself was, how was it that the Hong Kong youth were so well-versed in matters of government, in matters of uh, democracy, freedom, justice, equality? And so I decided to come back and make the plunge to join politics in Malaysia. Uh, my parents thought that was a horrible decision. Um, some days I think the same. But <laughs> as you can see with, with the events of 9th May, that uh, politics in Malaysia has entered a very new and exciting stage. 9th of May was just a reset button for the country and there is a lot of work to do. So when I looked at the title of today's uh, forum and also the description, uh, we wanted to discuss the uh, psychodynamics behind the elections and also the aspirations of the youth. Um, so I looked at what psychodynamics was all about. And uh, one of the interesting points uh, raised by Sigmund Freud was that psychological energy is constant and it only comes to rest through kartasis, through expression. And I thought, Maybe this is what Malaysia really needs right now, a form of catharsis that we started on the 9th of May. Even as a child following politics, I always thought that we Malaysians are very good at sweeping things under the carpet. We are always told not to discuss sensitive matters. We are always told to let things slide. You know, they say, Melayu mudah lupa. But I think this is the time to discuss things um, more openly. The actors have changed, but we can see in various issues that mindsets still remain uh, when it comes to especially issues of minorities. For example, 30% quota of uh, female ministers or the push to, uh, to lower the voting age to 18. And so I'd like to propose uh, this new concept of democracy, um, which what my friend likes to uh, quote. He says that democracy, a kind democracy, is one that follows the decision of the majority, protects minorities, and forgives the individual. And this is especially important to us, those who support Pakatan Harapan today, that Right now, we are the majority, but we have to listen to the minorities and forgive extreme individuals like Jamal Yunus. <laughs> and this comes to my next point. I think the challenge for us now really is 
nation building. As Syed uh, just uh, mentioned just now about the youth votes in Kelantan and Trunganu, we should be looking at them as a whole. Did you know in Selangor, there's a new township called Bandar Baru Bangi? And in Bangi, if you look properly, the billboards do not feature women without headscarves. And there is no alcohol so in Bangi. In fact, there was a residence protest in 2014 when it was rumoured that uh, I think Tesco or Aeon wanted to sell alcohol in the neighbourhood. And you might think, oh, these are just a small pocket of hardliners. They're conservatives. But the more salient question is, the fact is, the residents in Bangi are upper middle class professionals. They are educated doctors, lawyers, and engineers. And this completely turns, you know, turns our idea of enlightenment up on its head. We always think with education, we become more liberal, we become more open-minded. But that is not always the case. And when we also talk about the economy, uh, my colleague and our our Deputy Minister of Youth and Sports likes to say, people like to talk about bread and butter issues, but some people ask, is the bread and butter halal? <laughs> <laughs> so these are important things that we need to consider when we think of nation building, when we think of Bangsa Malaysia. There are a lot of things that we need to renegotiate, there are a lot of things that we need to redefine, even words such as a liberal, secular, what do they actually mean? And the most important thing is we need to rebuild trust. Shortly before the elections, um, one SIFO from Ideas did a survey of urban Malay voters. And one of the more interesting slash troubling uh, results that I found from that survey was that even urban Malay voters equivalate DAP with Chinese. So if you're Chinese, you must be from DAP. If you're from DAP, you must be Chinese. And for me, that is a problematic mindset because if you're someone who's opposed to the DAP, then you would very easily think that all Chinese are opposed to me. Similarly, if you're someone who has fear of Chinese, you would automatically fear the DAP. And that does not make, that does not bode well for trust. So these are the things we have to grapple with. I don't have answers for them yet, but as youth, what can we do? We talk a lot on social media platforms, but we need to make our physical presence known. And I always say at various forums, until it's so tiresome, but I always say that youths are the leaders of tomorrow, but we must be trained today. So to the young ladies and gentlemen in the room, now is the time to make your mark. And when we talk about things like democracy and human rights and freedom of expression, it does not necessarily have to be big things at the national level. You can do it at the local level too. For example, ladies, when you go to a meeting, if there's someone making inappropriate remarks, you can call that person out. In my office, I'm planning to um, renovate one of the rooms to build a nursery for my female staff so that they can bring their children there. These are the small things we can do, but we have to make our physical presence known. So keep tweeting on social media, keep having those discussions, but come out, engage with your representatives, come out, engage with your local government, because this is Malaysia Baru, things are different. We are here to listen and we are here to work. Thank you very much. Thank you, Yiwei, for her passionate speech. Um, I think Sadiq and Yiwei shows that youth are not leaders of tomorrow. They're leaders today. <laughs> and I think that's the beauty of it. And I, we, I think with their election, uh, at least we can, it's a, it's a manifestation that youth are leaders of today and we need more of you to be at the forefront. Uh, one of the reasons why I predicted the Malay tsunami 
correctly, is because I realize one thing that most people don't realize. 75% of Malaysians are living in urban areas. 67% of, of Malays are living in urban areas. Just that many of them are living in urban areas but voting in Moa, which is a semi-urban area, or Kluang, or Aitam, or Kuala Kangsa. That means we are, in many ways, very similar. We are stuck in the KL traffic every day. We have to deal with the same sort of uh, economy, same sort, same sort of challenges. We are quite similar. We are more similar than different. When you're in a rural setting, it is easily uh, fall, you, you can easily fall into segregation. But when you're in urban area, they, we are more, com more similar than different. And this is where the challenge for all of us to articulate issues beyond racial label, beyond the old issues, and look at the common issues. But also, I think there is a need for us to think of Malaysians not just in racial labor, but think of everyone as individual, as woman, as a mother, as a father, as a young, uh, young person. They may have different needs and they have different congregation. And how do we actually give them voice and change their life for the better in different aspects of their life? And I think ultimately why right-wing conservative politics can survive or can thrive, it is because of insecurity, because of lack of trust. And I think the challenge for all of us here is how to build trust how to actually build a common future. So with that, I open uh, for discussions. Good afternoon, Sadar Chintong and fellow panelists. I'm Zheng Hong from Taylor's University. Can you explain or clarify the current position of JPA, which I read in newspaper is now under the direct control of parliament? And second question, what is the current position of government, whether or not to restore the overseas scholarship, which is cut during, because of the recalibration of budget? Thank you. Okay, next question. Hi, uh, my name is Brian. I'm from Kuching, Sarawak. I have two questions. My first question is uh, for Sadara Said. Um, you have pushed for the voting age to be lowered to 18, but before this government, it's seen that the politics is a taboo issue in schools. So they, from there, we see that there's low awareness of politics. So what do you suggest that um, how is this institutional reform going to happen so that our choices are informative choices and not just choices influenced by parents or teachers? My second question is for the whole panel. Um, throughout this whole forum, we're stating that there's a swing in Malay voters, in Chinese voters. But one of my opinions that coming from Sarawak, there's a very strong Sarawakian sentiment. As we can see that BN is considered a fixed deposit. Sarawak is considered a fixed deposit throughout um, the whole elections. So how do you see, given anti-Najib, the Najib is out of the picture now. So how do you see GPS as a new party? Would it be a um, friendly party to Pakatan Harapan? Or would it still be a competition? Thank you. Yeah, good afternoon. My name is Ng Jinwei. Uh, my question is to the whole panel. I would like to ask, what are your opinions on accepting students to public university based on quota? Sadiq, you want to take? Yeah, two parts. Firstly, is on... Undi 18. How do we ensure that voters are ready and in the end they become informed voters in contrast to those who could easily be controlled by parents or teachers? There are two parts here. One is, I think we should not underestimate the wisdom of 18-year-olds today. Um, and do not overestimate the wisdom of those who are above 50. Because um, a lot of young people today, especially with access to the internet, and also especially in the new Malaysia where political discussions will happen on a daily basis, not just through TV3 and Utusan, but also with their friends, family members, and therefore them partaking in that process, I think it's already maturing enough. That's one. Two is... I believe as soon as we announce that voting will start at 18, year old, at, at 18 years old, there are a few effects. One is, there'll be a very big incentive for political parties to reach out to youth voters 
starting by the age of 18 years old. Because at the moment, why would politicians, why would they want to reach out to those who are 18 when they know that that's not their target group? Why do I want to include them in my school of democracy or in my own, uh, or, or in my own party or give them positions in the party or train them from young when in the end they are too young or seem to be too young to even vote? But once we reduce it to 18, there's an incentive factor for political parties to start reaching out to that category and as a consequence, there'll be a lot of debates and dialogues on that front. Second part is the government then will definitely play a very big role in shaping political education. But I want to say this with, again, a pinch of skepticism. Political education should not be an ammunition for information indoctrination of a particular political belief. Because you do not want another BTN. And I like to correct this, I think remember some of the media quoted that BTN will not be abolished. It will be. Okay, there's a clarification there. I think there will be an announcement on this. Um, it's just more about how do we best bring just and fair political education? Because you do not want the version of BTN where it's, kalau tak ada UMNO, matilah Melayu. I know because I had to go through that multiple times. But we want a forum of political education, debate and dialogue where political views are respected regardless of which party it is from. That one, we must have it. Political education must start from young. I think there are a lot of things which we can do, but I can't present it all now, uh, obviously from the youth ministry. I think my colleague here, Stephen Sim, is here as well. But it can happen in multiple different ways. It's about empowering Parliament Belia. It's about ensuring that, um, educa that, that uh, education in schools also includes some level of political workshops to ensure that they are grassroots democracies. For example, in schools, some schools, a lot of elite schools already have democratic actions, you know, by having, even when you pick the class monitor, you have to vote for them or pick for the, yeah. But that's usually in top schools. In my school, previously, I know I didn't have that. It's all, you know, you are the teacher's pet, you'll get selected. Um, so, you know, it's having a change in mindset and ensuring that we democratize from the top to the bottom. So I believe that it can be done. It can be done um, relatively quickly. And I think by this term, I believe we will be able to reduce voting age to 18 years old. And I believe that will shift um, what Malaysian politics will be like. I think Chin Tong predicted quite well because young voters in particular are a lot more open-minded. They're not loyal to any political party. It can hurt us. I don't know why people keep on saying, oh, it will only benefit Pakat I No. Like, <laughs> they're not loyal to any political party. It can swing. But... They're more open-minded, they are open to dialogues and forums. At the same time, they, will, they are more keen on the multiracial Malaysia. If you look at uh, outcomes, uh, uh, sorry, of, of, of uh, research done by Mdeka Center, Ilham Institute, multiple different think tanks all showed that young people associate to the Malaysian identity uh, first or a lot more in comparison to those who are 30 and above. But again, that can change very quickly if we do not have institutional reforms. Because it might start off being more Malaysian, but then if the institutions define their identity and we do not reform those institutions, then there's nothing much which we can do. Second question, and then a more controversial one, it's on quota-based universities. I think that one at the moment, we're trying to find a balance and I don't dare to comment that much now because it's still being uh, in the research works with the Ministry of Education, because we want to ensure that there is representation among all races and all groups, and at the same time, we do not ignore the most important thing, which is the B40. The ones who are genuinely underprivileged, and the ones who receive the greatest backlash of all forms of discrimination, not just race-based, but also class-based discrimination. So there must be a concrete and comprehensive policy uh, which will, be, which will be pushed forward uh, instead of me just giving an answer of yes or no. Thank you. I'll take uh, Brian's question about the Sarawakian sentiment. So I campaigned in Sarawak during the Sarawak state elections in 2016 and it was very difficult. It was very painful um, because we were dealing 
we were up against the Sarawak for Sarawakians uh, sentiment at that time. Um, I'm going to very bluntly say that, uh, well, while we hope that GPS is friendly towards us in Parliament and we hope that they will vote according to their conscience on bills that affect Malaysians, um, my personal opinion is that they're a bunch of frogs. <laughs> And so when we talk about Bangsa Malaysia, I think there needs to be an acknowledgement by us as Pakatan Harapan of the importance of Sabah and Sarawak. We need to redefine again that identity of Malaysia, not to just uh, call it Melayu, China, India and Lion, Lion. But uh, campaigning in Sarawak takes hard work. It takes a lot of uh, yeah, it takes a lot of local efforts. Um, I have a story though. My friend Mordi Bimo, who is now the member of parliament of Mas Gading, uh, took seven years to win the seat. So seven years ago, he contested for the parliament of Mas Gading, lost. Two years ago, he contested for the state seat of Tasik Biru, lost again 45 to 55%, very close fight. This time he won because he and his campaign team totally changed their approach. Instead of going into villages and telling villagers what they should do and cannot do or who to vote, they got the villagers to run the campaigns themselves. So it is a slow, long process and I do apologize, you know, sometimes on behalf of West Malaysians, uh, who like to blame Sabahans and Sarawakians for the fixed deposit situation. It doesn't help anyone. Um, but in this new Malaysia, I am hoping that we can be more inclusive and more understanding of the difficulties that Sabahans and Sarawakians face. The fourth speaker emerge, emerges again. Uh, just to put things in context, just to put things in, in context, when we talk about voting, lowering voting age to 18 years old, it means that we are now, uh, we, we have to now talk to the 13 years old. You get what I mean? If we are talking about 18 years old voting in 2023, 20, 20, then we have to now start talking to the 13 years old and treating them as adults. And that will change our mindset. That will change the mindset of the government. That will change every one of us in terms of thinking of how we deal with people, how we deal with young people. 54% of Malaysians are below 30 years old, age zero to age 30. And I think there's a huge uh, reservoir of energy that Sadiq has to tap into. <laughs> On the question of Sarawak, why Sarawak sentiment, Sabah sentiment, Johor sentiment became so important in the last few years? Why it happened at the same time? Because I, I was banned from campaigning in Sarawak in 2016, but I campaigned in Sarawak in 2011, when, the, when it was, uh, there was no questions. So there was a period of time that no one actually asked the questions of uh, whether you're a Sarawak, Sarawakian-based party or not Sarawakian-based party. But why suddenly, between 2014 and 2017, there was a height of regional sentiment, which has been there. I, I acknowledge that there's a Kelantani sentiment, there's a Penang sentiment, there's everywhere. But there was a common factor. That factor was because the center lost its legitimacy and credibility. Because the central government has no legitimacy, no moral authority, no credibility. So this government, there is a challenge that this government has to deal with. Whether you have national credibility, whether you, are, you have moral authority, and whether you have legitimacy. If the national government has a sense of purpose, then the regions will not feel that they have to be, they have to stay apart from the national. And I think this is our challenge, how to give a sense of purpose how to give a sense of national purpose. My final point is about identity politics. Very often, we spend most of our time on identity politics. We see ourselves in different identity, and we either see ourselves as victim, 
or we come in forcefully, righteously. But in New Malaysia, in Malaysia Baru, I think what we need is empathy. What we need is empathy. It's not righteousness, it's not a sense of victimhood, but a sense of empathy. Once you come in with a different mindset, you come in with a mindset of trying to empathize, I think we'll have a different set of dialogue. We'll have a different way, different, different conversation. And I, I really hope that we don't either come in as a victim or come in as someone who is too righteous. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Phoenix. Uh, Saudara Sadiq, you spoke about how governments play an important role in delivering education to empower the youth to make informed decisions. I would like to take this opportunity to highlight the power in collaboration between government and NGOs, because NGOs are the direct expression of active citizenship, and they are and they should be recognized as an essential element of democracy. And I can tell you right now, there are grassroots movements by the youth. For example, Farah and myself, we are founders of Youth, youth Citizen Diplomats Malaysia. We're a brand new grassroots youth-led um, movement that arose from the inspiration from GE14. All of us are first-time voters, and we want to mobilize Malaysian youth to actively and meaningfully participate in nation building. So. Sa Saudara Chintong, you say that the Ministry of Youth and Sports and the government has a reservoir, has the youth-powered reservoir of energy that we can tap into. And I'm telling you right now, here we are. We're ready, willing, and eager to participate in creating the Malaysia we want to see. So my question to you is how do we go about creating this synergistic relationships and partnerships and collaborations so that we can really truly meaningfully design programs that are by the youth and for the youth to meaningfully participate in creating the Malaysia we want to see. Thank you. Yeah, good afternoon everyone, uh, especially the panels. Uh, I was involved in the sport uh, before in 1998, Sukom 1998. Uh, oh yeah, by the way, my name is James. Huh? And I was uh, deeply involved in Sukom 98. And unfortunately, many of my plans and uh, uh, dreams uh, scattered and went to six feet underground uh, during the Sukom 1998 because uh, the purpose, everything, all the plans require corruptions which I was fully against. So none of my plans were able to carry out because my plan is no corruption. So we are watching the World Cup today, and I wonder, is there any program to steal up this uh, you know, energy? Not only uh, uh, this World Cup, there are many kind of other sports like, you know, and get rid of that corruption and sincerely pick up the real talented and passionate on that sport for everybody without bias, prejudice, and do it impartially. And of course, make sure the person really have the talent and the passion on it. And can we have a program start from today, as soon as possible, so that I hopefully within our lifetime, in 20 years time, we can see we are in the World Cup. You know, at least even you can get to the last, I doesn't mind, you know, as long as we are in the, one of the top <laughs> 32 is enough. Thank you. Uh, hi, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Chester Day from the H Financial Daily. Uh, Minister, just now you mentioned that the BTN will be abolished. May I know uh, when is it going to be abolished? And um, you were tasked to reduce the voting age to 18 years old. Uh, is there going to be a bill presented to the parliament by July, middle of July? A lot of things should happen yesterday, but it may take some time. Huh? <laughs> Uh, yeah, hi, my name is Reza Majid. Uh, I run a sports program that brings young professionals together as well as uh, youth as far as player development and also bringing coaches and players and organizers together uh, through technology. Uh, I think it sort of uh, reiterates a bit of what's been said in the last couple of questions in the sense of uh, in the previous government and, and historically I think there's been an issue as far as the private sector and the government and maybe gatekeepers in the way of getting things done. 
uh, not knowing really the best way to, you know, get proposals through. So could you talk a bit about uh, your government and how that will change or pragmatically, you know, to, to, to go off of uh, the energy of the young lady uh, earlier? I think a lot of the youth do want to do things, but we're not really sure how to get things done when it comes to relating to the government. So is there any practical or pragmatic things that we need to know in order to engage with the government? Yeah, four, four questions. Um, I'll try my best to answer as quickly as possible. One is towards Phoenix. It's about government cooperation with NGOs. This is something which I agree 100%. Reason being is, the days where the government knows best is over. NGOs operate in a way in which they are very sustainable. They're run by conscionable people who want to see change while not yet in the government framework. At the same time, it's not loyal to parties or political parties, which means that that's very good. Even I remember during the second day when I was in office, when I received the briefing from my KSU, one of the first things uh, which we discussed about is to ensure that citizenry engagement can be increased and intensified. And how do we best ensure that the programs which we run are not short and For example, one off program and then mati. And the best way is to actually empower NGOs. Because NGOs have been there for a very long time, run by experts, and are not loyal. So as a consequence, they are for the cause. Currently, we are looking into this. I had a chat with, if you guys know, uh, Sarah Chen and also um, Abir from Lenin, which is to empower young women, especially professional women who are young, and to see how we can form strategic collaboration on that. Because my biggest fear is that Previously, a lot of the programs and activities run by KBS, while it's youth-focused, but when we look at the studies done, it's predominantly participated by men. So we want to also include more young women in. Um, I think there'll be, oh, sorry, I can't reveal everything now. I think it's literally the first week. No, no, not even a week yet. I only entered office last Tuesday, so it's not even a week yet. Um, and also, definitely in terms of youth engagements, NGOs, there will be a comprehensive plan which we will present in the, new, uh, in the near future. But immediate things which you can do. Firstly is to know that young people now are hurt more than ever. I mean, the fact that the Prime Minister, despite being 92 years old, soon to be 93, have appointed the most youth ministers in the history of Malaysia is indicative of how important the youth votes are and therefore acknowledging how important collaborations with youth NGOs can be. So you already have your group. Ensure that you get as many people on board, be as vocal as possible. For example, I want to address the gentleman in front of me uh, with, I don't want to call it a play card. I think it's an A3 paper. Um, no, no, I, I respect his viewpoint. Um, and the reason why I also want to address him because I think he has the right to express his viewpoints. I acknowledge it. Uh, my only comment is uh, Malaysia cannot be built in a day. I think hopefully you get the message. Um, but what I like to say, I remember, I think about a year back, a few students from UM did the same on 1MDB. And after that, they received, they were called up by their disciplinary committees and boards and action was taken against them. And I hope, I really hope no one will take action against him. Huh? <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, this is a change and you must be very vocal and use your own means to be as vocal as possible, whether it's in public forums, private dialogues. But just try your best to get the word out because in the end, we will listen. And we've seen so many changes happening in social media. Just because you air your view viewpoint in social media, governments actually listen and change their viewpoints. I mean, some people will say, oh my God, you're so wobbly. No, no, no. We want to listen. <laughs> we don't want to be arrogant by going, oh, I've made a decision, so I don't care what you say. The fact that Tun Dr. Madi, who really loves education, I know how much he loves, he loves it, and I was there when he had to let go of the education portfolio because he knew that that contradicted with uh, the, the manifesto of Harapan. But he said, oh, on social media, because he, he read it, he knows what's happening. He said, never mind, let's put that behind. So, it will work. I hope I'll see you in apply for Padana Fellowship Program where you'll get opportunity to intern with ministers. Apply. For Parliament Belia, I hope Parliament Belia is no longer, you know, exclusively for those above 25. I mean, to me, it should be more focused to 16, to 18, to 21. Um, but there are so many programs and forums we should create which will be more sustainable, and NGOs will be the one 
will drive it forward. Second one is from James, uh, corruption in sports. This one will be one of my toughest, or our <laughs> toughest battles, to be honest, because on the one hand, we cannot directly interfere with persatuan, persatuan politics. And you can ask a sports reporter, they'll tell you that persatuan politics is worse than party politics. The worst. Yeah, sports associations, the politics is worse than party politics. And if you interfere, you can get deregistered internationally. Yeah? They are, that's why I was seeking the advice of a few people. And they said, very dangerous how you want to wriggle forward. But what can be done? One is now at the moment is to try our best to depoliticize sports. That means gradually ensure that if there are political appointees and sports bodies and associations, ensure that there's a slow phasing out. Not slow, lah, but it must be a gradual phasing out. Because again, it can't be direct. Me just going, all of you get out. I can't do that. <laughs> it's not as easy as Tunem saying political appointees get out. No, nope. sports associations have their own constitution. Um, Secondly, at the same time, when it comes to corruption in sports, is to ensure that we have more open tender process. At the same time, ensure that technocrats in sports lead the sporting industry, not politicians. And the commitment from KBS, is something which uh, myself, Stephen Sim, have discussed, is to ensure that we don't act like experts, that when we get into the ministry, I want this, 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 do it. In the end, another minister comes in, this, 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 do it. In the end, it just destroys sports. But it's to be guided by technocrats in the very industry to move forward and to reduce as much power as possible, which were entrusted in the hands of minister, to ensure that political interference no longer happens and to ensure that the technocrats are the ones who run the sporting industry. Third, sports industry, sorry. Third is on ooh, BTN and... Yeah, when? BTN BT abolishment, wait for the formal announcement. I mean, previously we've made formal announcements, but I think it was misinterpreted um, because we still want to have political education and character building, but we just don't want that political education and character building to then be used as an ammunition for information indoctrination, um, which is partisan, on partisan lines. That's we don't want. Um, so there will, I mean, there will be a full explanation of this soon. Second, on when Undi 18, um, the promise which I can give, at least from my part or my commitment, is to ensure that it will be done in this term. Exactly which parliamentary seating? I think I need to discuss that with, other, with, with, with my leadership. But within this term, we'll see that happening. The fact that Tun Dr. Mahdi has commented on this and said that he's in favour of this is indicative of how serious we are. Thank you. I'll just say something very short uh, to supplement uh, Sadara Said's uh, invitation to NGOs. So if you are operating any NGOs in this room, come to my office. We can talk. <laughs> yeah, it's at Taman Paramount, PJ. Look up my Facebook page. Get their ways, directions there. Yeah, let me know. I think I'll just make some general comments because the two politicians are able to give you on policy matters and government issues, which I am not able to. But what I will do is, one thing that now the politicians are here with me, one thing that needs major change in this country is the quality of education. <laughs> Everything boils down to that. And that is very well articulated in my research. And what we should do is, if you see the society today, the Chinese send their children to Chinese schools. The Malays send their children to government schools. The elite Malays send their children to private institutions or overseas. Therefore, there is a complete segregation of the young from small, and they only probably converge at the university level, by which time it's too late for the integration. So on one hand, there is the uh, one extreme of Ketuanan Melayu. On the other extreme is Bangsa Malaysia. And we, it both are, we are somewhere in the middle, struggling to achieve ultimately the Bangsa Malaysia. And for that, 
education should start now and we should change education to make sure that we get a united Malaysia. I'm interested in race politics in Malaysia. So I have um, two questions on two sides, on the opposition and the government right now. So my first question is, will we ever be able to see a centrist, multiracial opposition anytime soon? That's one. And the second thing is about um, seeing how UMNO and PAS is trying to like, try to like taunt PAs to also play the identity politics role now. What's the role of PPBM and Amana in this, would, would they feel the right-wing politic role within Pakatan Harapan? And the second question is, what are Pakatan's specific policies to uplift and address the economic insecurity of the Bumi Putra? I got three questions, actually, short ones. Uh, first one is the facilities owned by youth and sports ministries. Uh, there are plenty of sports youth centres around and all that, but most of it has been given to private sector to manage it, which is good. But I think it was also should be taken into consideration that social responsibilities should be done for CSR projects, for schools surrounding it, to be used as, uh, you know, to educate. These are the upcoming future youths, uh, especially the primary and secondary schools. And uh, this, it, the point I'm making here is, is based on my own experience, where my kids are going to a secondary school. They have a Paralympic uh, center just across the road, and the school swimming clubs are unable to use it because they are charging the commercial rates and they are not even assisting them to do it. Uh, you know, because they say we have enough students, we can't cater for it. And the students are as transported using a bus to a five kilometer away facility. So I find this is really uh, you know, something we should look into because the priority should be developing our you know, uh, kids, right? Uh, the next one, um, one of the things you mentioned about political, uh, just not a swing of words, um, yeah, I think uh, you've uh, overlooked the fact that there were many AMNO members, MIC members, MCA members who actually, um, what do you call, uh, went and campaigned against their own parties to vote for Pakatan. Uh, and majority of these were youths uh, and who were actually was not a party hardliners, supporters who wants to follow toe the party lines, but they had their own conscience saying this is not right, so we was, want to stand for what is right. Um, and they supported Pakatan during the GE14. How are you going to handle this, you know, when it comes GE15? Because they will be torn between, you know, at the same time I want to be in the party, but, you know, there is a situation here. Will they continue supporting it? Because they actually made a difference in terms of swinging the fence-sitters. Because imagine a person who's an AMNO member and go and tell another AMNO member or AMNO party followers, hey, don't vote for AMNO. So they actually made an incredible uh, impact on it, right? Okay, third one, uh, there is a rush of AMNO members to Bersatu, actually, basically. Uh, not PKR, not BAP, but Bersatu. Uh, even elected MPs, but I know Tun is holding them and say, just be independent and support us. Um, will this impact Pakatan Narapan's policy due to possible internal pressure via Bersatu? Uh, even the return of patronage policy, you know, because... Bersatu, to look at from how it was evolved, is actually mis mostly are from AMNO members who actually were not happy with Najib and went out and set it up. So we are just concerned on that because PKR has a clear stand, DAP has a very clear stand. Uh, so we are still not sure of how Bersatu is holding it and the chairman of the Pakatan is Bersatu. Right? Okay, thank you. Hi, I'm Sean from Help University and also from DAP. Okay, so... <laughs> yeah, just... Just to introduce myself, okay? Um, so I have uh, some questions to ask the panel, okay? So now we are in a new Malaysia, but unfortunately we can see that there are still old Malaysian attitude. I mean, we, don't, we can't really you know, define what is a new Malaysian attitude yet, but some things in the old Malaysia that has to be phased out. The first thing is racism. Definitely. The second thing is like, what? like radical extremism, okay? And you, when we observe, like I observed recently, just a few days on social media especially, we still see cyber troopers and keyboard warriors who are like attacking people, a lot of racist issues. Like when we talk about UEC straight away, it becomes a Chinese racist, Chinese issue, Chinese are racist shit and all that. Okay, sorry for my language. And okay, and recently, Sadiq, you know what? Okay. You know, um, no, no, um, because, you no, know, this kind of 
cyber troopers thing are still there, especially from the opposition parties. Most of them are from the opposition parties now, and it actually caused a, Quick gay, one. To, a, gay, to, a gay guy to resign from his post. So the first, the first thing is, how, do Pakatan, how does Pakatan going to curb this racism issue and radical extremism issue, the religious one especially? Okay? And you know, this kind of issue can cause a damage to a person, so, especially the racism part. So thanks a lot. Uh, I would like to take this opportunity to recognize uh, or acknowledge the presence of uh, Saudara Steven Sim, uh, Deputy Youth and Sport Ministers. Uh, thank you, Jin Tong. Actually, I'm not planning to be the fifth speaker, but uh, <laughs> thanks for the, uh, the, the space here. I'm just going to say uh, three things. Number one is that in the last term, I was actually the youngest member of parliament. But... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I am 36 I'm, and I'm feeling very, very old already. <laughs> but uh, to give you some kind of, uh, hopefully, some kind of inspiration about this new government, the direction of the new government is number one. Um, you know, since the 5th of May, uh, and this is what, what I have written in my third book coming out soon, please. Uh, <laughs> stay tuned. We have moved, at least on paper, from the uh, framework of Malay, Chinese, Indian, towards democracy, bersatu, amana, and what's the other one? Keadilan. So I think that, that at least is one indication that the thematic framework of the political scenario has shifted. But finally, and the third, and I think more importantly, today we had a meeting, Sadiq and I, bro Sadiq and I, we had a meeting with uh, some of the top management in, in the ministry, and two things I want to highlight, or rather two words. And you can't imagine these words being spoken in the previous regime. Number one is, and these, both of these are from the minister, not from me, uh, uh, embarrassingly. Uh, number one, he called for open tender, my God. <laughs> Tepuk lah, sikit. <laughs> he called for open tender. I'm not going to tell you on what issue. But number, secondly, he called for election, uh, an open invitation to certain appointments in the ministry. And I think this is very good indication of how things are moving, at least within KBS. And, and I'm, I'm sure it, an indication of how uh, things are moving with the government as a whole. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Stephen. I invite uh, all the panelists to conclude, to reply and conclude. Thank you. That's what I point out that Stephen is being too kind. He contributed uh, in a lot of the ideas. Um, and I'm blessed to have someone like him in the team. La. Uh, I think it will be now Team SS, Stephen Seam and Syed Sadiq. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> there, are a, there are a lot of questions. I'll try my best to answer all. I'll group them into categories. One is, what is and where is PPBM today? I think that's a question. I don't want to call it PPBM. Now it's Bersatu, by the way. Previously, we can't call Bersatu. Now we can. Um, where is Bersatu today, especially with the influx of AMLO supporters and possibly MPs in Bersatu? Will that tilt the power balance? One is, I don't think so. Bersatu has 13 seats, 13. PKR has 50, how many? Almost 50 something. The AP has 46, 42. So, I mean, even let's presume the best case scenario. All of AMNO, not best, I think it's worse. All of AMNO MPs jump into PPBM. Even then, we cannot overpower Harapan, right? Um, but at the same time, I agree with what Tunok Chamadi said, they should not automatically join Bersatu. They should have an interim period in which then we will gauge their allegiance and what their stance are on important issues, especially on policy issues. Because this is more like a, a cleansing period of pembersihan, <laughs> so that we know that they're not going to enter Bersatu just for contracts and projects and for positions, but they are genuinely for the cause. Second, I want to correct the misperception which states that Bersatu members, or majority of them, are ex -amno. Do you know that the majority of Bersatu members are young people below 35 years old who have never joined any political party before? You can look at our membership. Vast majority are young people below 35 who have never joined a political party before. Obviously, people keep on looking at the top, that's true. But even if you look at our Supreme Council members, there are so many people who have never joined any political party. There is a Mahasiswa a student who's still studying in the university, who's on the Supreme Council. Um, 
And I mean, there are so many young people at the same time. There are so many people who have never joined any political party before. But because, again, uh, we wanted to attract the AMNO votes, it was positioned that way. And while you asked, there are a lot of people joining Bersatu. Uh, sorry, how do we deal with um, the rise, the possible rise of AMNO members or BN who previously campaigned and voted for Harapan, but in the next term will be stuck in between? We must convince them that Harapan is the future that the coalition members and parties, if it's up to me, I want Harapan to be a, a party of its own, if it's up to me, of course. Um, but we need to convince to them that sitting and staying in BN is no longer worth it, and they must join. And we must open up our gates and doors, especially to the normal members. We cannot be vindictive, we cannot be vengeful. That's why I dislike the culture of witch hunting, you know? Like, whenever I announce there's an AMNO member, a member, not even a you know, a Ketua Bahagian or MP joining, then there'll be some people who be very resistant in the party. Oh, no, no, cannot. I think at times they feel threatened, especially when we bring in young professionals into. Because they'll be like, oh, these people only want power. No, they're not even asking for any position. But maybe they feel challenged because in the future, these people might be very popular and might be pushed as the next MP or Adun, therefore taking their position. But in Bersatu, we do not want to repeat the AMNO culture where young professionals and smart people are left on the outside because we fear that we might be replaced. We don't want that. And is Harapan a centrist coalition or when will it be a centrist coalition? I believe it already is. It's not perfect. And this is in relation to the question of the new Malaysia. It's not perfect. What is this new Malaysia? We're still defining it. How do we deal with race and religious relations? It's not easy. Do we want to go to extreme left or extreme right? How do we formulate a policy on it? So for an example, when we want to deal with, for an example, this question about how do we help the Bumiputra community, do we just look at Bumiputra or do we feel or do we zoom into B40 once we generally need help, people of different races and religions, while it being majority from the Bumiputra community? So there are important policy questions which must be resolved. And I believe with a public policy solution, we will be able to come up with the right answers. Because we don't want to just think and act from a racial and religious lens to the point that the outcome will be horrible for the very race which we deem to protect. That is bad for the future of Malaysia. So in summary, because um, there are so many questions, I want to talk about PPBM or Bersatu. I don't think we will be an overpowering member in the coalition. If anything now, um, we definitely cannot power or overpower the coalition with the numbers of seats. But we want to be a partner, an equal partner or an equitable partner in the united coalition, which will um, shape the future of Malaysia and not just as one single party and not just as partners of convenience, but as family members in forming the new Malaysia. Thank you. Very quickly, I'll summarize that for Party Bersatu, admitting AMNO members is not a threat as long as the AMNO members are the Ahli Biasa, the common man who wants to join from AMNO to Bersatu. Where they have to be careful is at the divisional and at the polit those who had held political posts. There you have to do some kind of a screening and cleaning. But to get the ordinary members, they should go all out and get as many as possible to strengthen themselves. Racism is not something you can erase like in the blackboard. You know, it, it, it's, it's a very deeply ingrained cultural problem and that will take time. And I think we have a leadership that understands all those issues. You, you hear the three of them talking, they know what, what are the issues and let's give them some time to address this, and I'm hopeful, there is hope in New Malaysia that they will be able to address. So let's be patient and give them. I think I'd like to go back to the concept of a kind democracy, again, where we accept the decision of the majority, we protect minorities, and we forgive individuals. I'd like to use this to apply to some of the questions that were asked. So with what I would call like centre voters or those uh, ex, I mean current AMNO, MCA, MIC members who campaign somehow 
for Pakatan Harapan in GE 14. I think this is a, if you know any, I think this is a good time to actually talk to them about ideas and ideologies. So we start moving beyond the themes of joining a race-based party. When it comes to issues like racism, extremism, and also one as uh, tricky as LGBT rights, I think the question uh, we have to ask ourselves is a, is a moral question. Are we equally human? Are we equally Malaysian? And that is a question we have to pose to those who oppose it. And how do we do it? I think uh, one of the better prescriptions is uh, like what Saudara Liu Chintong said, empathy. So we don't come in with our arguments with moral righteousness or superiority. We don't come in with victimhood. We come in with understanding. We call out the extreme individuals if they are blatantly homophobic, if they are blatantly racist. I think this Malaysia, we, we have to define that this is a Malaysia for all. And I just want to touch on the LGBT issue. A lot of times, the LGBT community is uh, stereotyped or stigmatized as, you know, being uh, deviant, uh, being, you know, sex workers involved in illegal activities, etc. But we have to ask ourselves, are we driving them into that kind of work, to black market activities, because we don't even want to provide them with jobs. So the question, I mean, some of you, you have your religious beliefs. We fully respect that. But outside of that, ask yourselves, do we consider LGBT equally human? Do we consider them equally Malaysian? And if we say yes to those questions, then we must provide them some dignity and some space to be productive citizens in Malaysia. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you. Let us thank our panelists and also all the audience who are here today. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks for this wonderful afternoon. Thank you.